All right, good morning, church family. How are you doing this morning? All right, let me do that again. Hey, good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're on campus or you're watching online. Thank you for just joining us and being a part of what God's doing here at First Colleyville. So I'm Cameron Bundy, the pastor of adult ministries here at First Colleyville, and I have the privilege of bringing God's word to you this morning. As you can see, Craig is out this Sunday. I was just hanging out with him yesterday. He's actually on vacation. Um, so he's been doing a lot of work here at the church. God's been working through him in mighty ways. And, you know, of course, through his wife, Liz, and through his daughters and so uh, they're taking a much needed break in Mexico so uh, he was telling me that I guess at nine o'clock as we're kicking off he was going to land and then at 10 15 he's going to be kicking it up in a lawn chair so uh, y'all be praying for him he's taking a much needed rest and and we all know he needs it um, and so as you know we've been moving through a series called leap of faith and so uh, what we've been doing is we've been looking at men and women in the Bible uh, who have demonstrated great faith. And so we've been looking at what's called the hall of faith. That's kind of what we refer to it as in Hebrews chapter 11. And so we've been looking at different people. We looked at uh, one week, we looked at uh, Enoch and how Enoch faithfully walked with God, looked at Abel and how Abel worshiped God faithfully. Uh, also got to take a look um, at Noah and how Noah uh, faithfully infiltrated his culture with the word of God. And of course, then if you remember when I taught on Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons, right? So we, if you remember that jingle, uh, we did Abraham and how Abraham faithfully waited on God. And then after that, we looked at Sarah, how does Sarah trust God in her doubts? And then we're going to continue that same journey today, looking at Moses. And so uh, we're going to continue. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to say, how can we trust God in our calling? How can we trust him in our calling. Now, I don't know about you, but this series has been very refreshing, right? To know that there's men and women in the Bible who have struggled, gone through the same challenges that we face in our own lives. Uh, that it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just us, that there's other people whom God used who went through the same challenges and struggles as we did. And so I'm excited to look at Moses today and say, okay, how does Moses teach us how we can trust God in our calling? So you know the drill, get your Bible out, pens out, paper out, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. That's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, but as you're turning there, I want to ask you this question. When you hear the term calling, what comes to mind? When you hear the term calling, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Now, if we were to take a poll in this room and everybody that's watching online with us this morning, I, I think we would get various responses, wouldn't we? Uh, you know, we would say our calling is our career, our calling is our education, our calling is our kids, our calling is our hobby. You know, we would have all these different responses, but I'm sure the commonality between all of those would be that it's our central purpose in life. Would you agree? Yeah, we all would nod our heads. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I thought. Uh, but where we would begin to disagree is when we would say, okay, what is my central purpose in life? Right, we would all have all kinds of answers in here. We would be, well, this is my calling and this is how God's using me and, and here's where he's using me in this place. And so, it, but the thing is that the commonality there is that it's our central purpose in life. But you know, along the way as we're um, on this discovery, on this road of a calling, there tends to be much frustration, confusion, anxiety. As we're trying to discover what is God calling us to do? God, what do you want me to do with my life? If it's so short, what do I do with the little amount of time that I have? And, and it's really hard to trust God in our calling so we begin to grow confused and anxious and frustrated with, with God and with ourselves and with our circumstances uh, because we don't know what to do. But, I, but what if I told you this? What if I told you uh, that God's desire is not for you to be confused, frustrated, or anxious about your calling in life. And you're all like, what? Are you serious? Yeah, God does not desire for you to be frustrated, confused, or anxious about your calling in life. In fact, the Bible has made it very clear what your call is in life. And he's giving you the tools and the resources to take next steps to make decisions in your life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the life of Moses and see how does God teach us how we are to walk with God in our calling so we can make those steps, make those decisions. So uh, let's start reading uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. And if you're there, uh, say word. Oh, perfect. I love it. All right, verse 23. This is the word of God. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. 
By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the uh, treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. Everybody say, by faith. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn may not touch uh, the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. And when the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned." Now, what a passage, right? And so before we go any further, what I want you to do is I want you to underline verse 27. If you go back and you read that verse 27 there, by faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden, or sorry, by faith, uh, Egypt, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. Underline that, verse 27 right there. Underline that, because that's going to be our focus verse. That's our hinge verse for this, uh, our time together. Now, as you look at this passage, it's really a summary, it's really a snapshot of the life of Moses, right? Everything from his birth all the way to the parting of the Red Sea, and they went through the Red Sea, as you know, in the story, and then it, it collapses over uh, Pharaoh and his people. And so we see this snapshot. Now, what I want you to do is right next to your margin of your Bible, I want you to write this, Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 35. Now you're going, okay, Cameron, why, you, why, why are you having me write this? Well, I want you to write this down because this is another summary of the life of Moses in the New Testament, looking back to the Old Testament um, and, and how this really begins to unpack the life of Moses. Now, we're not going to have time to go there today and unpack everything in, in that chapter, but I'm going to reference it today and I want you to know it's there. So if you're a student, you can look at it after the message and feel like, man, I've done something today, okay? Um, so, hey, uh, when we look back at that, when we look at chapter 7 of, of Acts, One of the things that the author points out there is that Moses' parents came from the tribe of Levi. Now, if you know anything about your Old Testament history, that's where the Levitical priests came from that were in charge of the Old Testament worship. So the tribe of Levi was very special, right? They were ones who really walked with God. And so it would make sense when we go back and we read verse 23, by faith Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents. And they didn't fear the king. Why? Because they were walking with God. And they fear God more than they fear man. They, they listen to God instead of listening to man. And so they hid the child. And Pharaoh, of course, he's growing insecure because the Israelites are growing up. They're becoming a large nation and, and they're becoming greater and greater and greater. And so he feared that they would overtake his kingdom. And so they, he ordered that every Hebrew newborn, when, it, when they were born, they would be thrown into the Nile in order to stop the population growth so that he can control them so that he can continue to have power and reign over the Israelites. But yet his parents walked with God. Yet his parents listened to God and feared God more than they feared the king. And all the while, while this horrendous order is being carried out in Egypt, God's hand is at work. God is moving among what it seems like chaos. He's bringing order in. And so as, 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 the, as the babies are thrown into the Nile, Moses' parents takes Moses and puts him in a woven basket, hides him among the reeds. And like God, he's working. And so Pharaoh's daughter comes down from the palace and bathes just like she always does and finds baby Moses, takes him up to the palace and raises him for 40 years. For 40 years, he would receive the best education. For 40 years, he would feed on the best food and drink the best wine. And, and, he, would, and he would also be dressed with top of the line clothes. Y'all, he had Nike Air Maxes. Come on, somebody, right? He was a Nike boy before Nike was even Nike. He probably had those Jesus sandals, y'all, right? Anybody seen those? They call them jandals. That's what what my wife calls them, jandals. So, you know, he had top of the line clothing. And for 40 years, that was his lifestyle. And then it says in verse 25 and 26 that he began to see that uh, his people were oppressed. He began to to find out that he was really a Hebrew and that his people were being oppressed by the Egyptian people. And and he's hearing these stories in the palace and he says, man, I got to leave this stuff behind. I'm going to leave my my power, my prestige, my possessions. I'm going to leave all of this behind and I'm going to go be among my people. And this is where the author of Acts comes in again and gives us another great detail. And he says in his detail that, that, that Moses went to his men, went down to the Israelites, assuming that they would know that God would deliver them through him. Now, key word there, he assumed. Now, does anybody know what assumptions do? 
<laughs> I'll leave it right there, right? So he makes his assumption and he goes on down and he's, he's, he's like, okay, God's going to use me in a great way. So I'm going to run ahead of God and I'm going to go down here. I'm going to take care of things. And we know that he goes down and he strikes this Egyptian dead. He flees for his life to the Midian desert. And there he spends another 40 years and he would find his wife and he would shepherd his father-in-law's sheep. But God would not speak to him for 40 years. Could you imagine 40 years of just silence? God not talking, you don't hear him. God, where do you want me to go next? For 40 years. After those 40 years, as he's going out and he's taking his sheep out, as he always does, God calls out to him via a burning bush. Now, does anybody wish that God would speak to a burning bush today? Can I get an amen? Anybody? You're like, come on, God, give me a burning bush like Moses had. Or I think of Bruce Almighty when in the movie, he goes, God, would you just give me a sign? And a truck drives by with all the signs in it, right? You ever seen that movie? If you haven't, you can go back and watch it. That's what I think of when I'm like, Lord, give me a sign. And so Moses gets called out by God through a, via a burning bush. And God says, hey, look, I know that you went ahead of me. And you tried to deliver them yourself, but I'm calling you ultimately to be with me. And if you're going to be with me, I'm going to send you out as my representative that's it, because I'm going to deliver the Israelites. I've heard their cry. I've heard them calling out to me. And so, so I'm going to deliver them, but I'm going to send you as my representative as I deliver them. And so he calls them out. And of course, he does as the Lord says. I love what D.L. Moody says in summary of Moses' life. He says he spent the first 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent the second 40 years learning he was a nobody. And then he spent the last 40 years discovering God can do something with, with a nobody. Right, so he went from thinking he was somebody, that he had all this power and prestige and possessions in Egypt. And then he finds out that he's really a nobody. And then God begins to show him in the last 40 years of his life what happens when we surrender our lives to God, when, we're, when we be with God, when we give God our yes, that God can begin to do something in our lives when we realize that we're really nothing and he's all that we need. See, when we think of our calling, we think of our central purpose, and often what happens is we tie it up all in our careers and our successes and our accolades and our kids and, and all the, the awards that they get, and, and we wrap it up in all of these things, and we wonder why they fall flat. We find no fulfillment in them. You lose a job, and you're going, man, my fulfillment was in my job, and now it's gone, and now I have no fulfillment. Man, my kids are out of the house now. My, everything was my kids and, and now my kids left the home and I don't know what to do. I don't have fulfillment. I, I, I've lost it all. You know, I'm, I wonder why. And I, I begin to think back and I thought about Tom Brady. You know, you ever know who Tom Brady is, right? The current quarterback of the Buccaneers, seven-time Super Bowl champ. You know, he was interviewed one time and they're, they're asking him, you know, what are you going to do now that you've won? This is when he's 27. Now that you won three Super Bowls at the age of 27, what are you going to do? And he said, honestly, I, I, I don't know, but there's got to be more. Y'all, did you catch that? Three times Super Bowl champ at the age of 27, making millions and millions of dollars. And he says, there's got to be something more to this life. That even these things were not finding fulfillment. That even these things would not satisfy in fact, he would try to retire, and it only lasted 40 days. 40 days, y'all. Could you imagine that? Some of y'all are like, yeah, I did that one time. I tried to retire, and it lasted about 40 days. And he was saying, I'm trying to find some kind of fulfillment. I'm trying to fill this hole. And here's the deal, y'all. Listen to this closely. Is that calling is much more than that. Your calling in life is much more than those things, the places you go to, because a calling is a present faithfulness to Jesus. In fact, that's the main idea I want us to get. So write this down. Main idea is calling is not a future destination, but a present faithfulness to Jesus. Right? We keep looking and, and God, where are you taking me? Where do you want me to go in life? Once I get there, then ultimately I found my calling in life. And what Jesus is saying, he said, look, your ultimate destination is not the calling. Your calling is a faithfulness to me in the presence, a faithfulness to Jesus in the now. That's the calling. So when you look at the life of Moses and you see his, his life, for the first 40 years, he found his purpose and meaning and his, his possessions, his prestige, his pleasures, and that didn't satisfy. So then he leaves the palace, sees his people oppressed and thought, okay, well, then my purpose is to deliver the Israelites. So I'm not even going to ask God what my purpose is. I'm just going to go do it because God's going to bless me in the process of it, right? And so he goes down and he tries to deliver the Israelites and then he ends up striking the Egyptian dead, makes a deadly mistake, runs off to the desert, spends another 40 years in the desert 
soul searching and trying to figure out what his purpose is in life and, and looking for the voice of God. And then finally, after 40 years, God calls him and he says, I'm going to use you. But, but, but to use you, I need you to be with me. Osginius said this in his book called The Call. He says, what brings us home is not our discovery of the way, but the call of the Father who has been waiting there for us all along, whose presence there makes home, home. See, as Moses kept looking and looking, and what is my purpose in life? Is it the Egyptian lifestyle? Is it to go down and deliver the Israelites? God, what is my call in life? And as he was trying to look and look and look and look, God was calling Moses closer and closer and closer to himself. In fact, as Moses was on a route of discovery, God was going to him and had found him right where he was. See, this is why when we read in verse 27 that most of, Moses persevered as one who sees him who is, in, who, who is invisible, that being God, is because, because Mo- Moses was walking with God. He was being with God instead of doing something for God. Now, if you go back, you remember he tried to do something for God, that didn't work out well. But the moment that he started being with God, things began to work out. And see, a lot of times what we're trying to do, church, is we're trying to do a lot of great things for God. If I could just do this one thing, if I could just accomplish this one thing, if I could just, and then you're not satisfied. And here Moses began to learn a valuable lesson that it's out of our being with God that we begin to understand what we're going to be doing for God. That our being with precedes our doing for him. That our being with him drives our doing for him. So that when those things that we are doing begins to come out from underneath us, like someone's pulling a map from underneath us, we don't lose our purpose and meaning in life. In fact, it's always intact. Why? Because God does not change. He's everlasting. And he gives us our main purpose, our central purpose for life. And what is that central purpose? He says that that central purpose is to make disciples. And you're saying, Cameron, what does that even mean? You can't summarize that in one word, Cameron. You can't. Calling is more difficult than that. And God's saying it's not that difficult. The calling is is to make disciples. And what that means is we're taking taking the same message that has transformed our lives, the gospel message that that we were once lost and now we've been found, that, that that I was dead in my sin, now I'm alive in Christ, taking that message and sharing that with our people in our workplaces, in our schools, in our hobbies, the sporting events that we go to, and we're sharing that with them, we're seeing them come to know Christ, we're taking them, we're helping them grow and walk with God and reach other people and invest their lives in others. And that is our primary mission and call in life. And as we live out that call, as we live out the primary call in our lives, God begins to lead us along our passions and our desires and our abilities And he says, hey, this is where I want you to work. And I want you to make disciples here at your work. This is where I want you to live. And where you live, that's where I want you to do this. But here's the deal is that a lot of us are going, God, where do we live? Where do do you want me to work? And he's saying, I want you to be with me. Stop asking me what to do. Be with me. And then I'll help you understand what you need to do. But here's the deal is a lot of us find ourselves frustrated because we're doing a lot of things and we can't find fulfillment. And God's saying, if you would just come, and be with me, I will give you direction. I will give you guidance. I will give you the wisdom to understand how to take that next step, how to make that next decision. Don't run ahead of God, but be with him and understand what that next step is. Don't be paralyzed by the decision that you're trying to make, but come and find rest. Come find rejuvenation in him who can give you direction. Paul says this in Colossians 3, 17, and, and, who, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Right, so he's pulling us, Paul's pulling us all the way back to the main purpose that everything we do, whether we're working, whether we're playing, whether we're hanging out with the kiddos, whether we're going to school, whether we're, whatever we're doing, we're doing it all for the Lord. Why? Because the, our central purpose is rooted in him. And when it's rooted in him, then, then we never find ourselves compromised. We never find ourselves toppling when things begin to be pulled out from underneath us because our central purpose is found in God and he's steady and he's steadfast and he's never changing. See, we don't have to look for some miraculous sign like a burning bush because God's already made it very clear right here what our mission is. That if we be the people of his word, that we would know exactly what we need to do in this life. We all wish that we would have some kind of burning bush, don't we? 
God talked to, to Moses in the past through a burning bush, but, but how does he speak to us today is probably the question you're thinking now. How does God speak to me today? And I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and I want you to hear this. It says, As long ago God spoke to our fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Do you catch that? That God in the past has spoke to his prophets in various ways at different times, just like Moses via a burning bush. But he said that today, today he speaks to us through his son, Jesus. And you're thinking, okay, well, what does that even mean that he speaks through our son, Jesus? Jesus is not here present, so how does he speak to us today in the present? Well, if we go back to Scripture and we go all the way back to the New Testament and we look at John 1, 14, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Who's the Word? Well, Jesus is the Word, meaning the Word became incarnate through Jesus, that God came down and through Jesus and Jesus was the Word and that through Him the revelation of God has been completed and we're not adding anything else, that the complete revelation has been, been revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Not only does he speak to us through his word, but he also speaks to us through his spirit. So if you go on to uh, John 14, 25 through 26, it says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain in you. But the counselor, everybody say counselor. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Now, key word there, everything I have told you. That means the Spirit's not revealing anything new that's not already been written here in the counsel of God's Word. Meaning that everything that Jesus has taught, the Spirit's only reminding us and teaching us what's already been taught. In fact, then if we go back and we look at John uh, chapter 12, verse 4, it says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, for I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said to you. So do you catch that? So, so Jesus is teaching what the Father has taught him and the Spirit is teaching what Jesus has already taught and everything has then been re written and recorded right here. This is the full counsel of the Word of God, the complete revelation that has been revealed through Jesus. And so if Jesus is teaching what the Father taught and the Spirit's teaching what Jesus has already taught, then we need to be a people about this Word because everything that the Spirit's gonna teach us is all right here. We're not adding to this. And I'll tell you right now, there's churches all across the United States, all across the world that are saying that this is not ultimate authority. In fact, they would say, if you just feel like it, that's your authority. And I'm telling you right now that in the scriptures all throughout the New Testament, all the way back to the Old Testament, because even the Old Testament points to Jesus and the New Testament testifies of Jesus. All of this, this is our ultimate authority in life. If we want to know what we want to do, then we need to be the people of the word. This is our wisdom. This is our guidance. This is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light to our path. Now, here's the deal. I know many of you are squirming in your seat right now and you're thinking, Cameron, God spoke to me in different ways. What do you mean that he only speaks through his word? You know, God is supernatural. And you can't box him in our little human boxes. We can't. In fact, he can communicate however he likes. He can communicate through our circumstances. He can communicate through other believers. He can communicate even via a dream. I've heard that overseas. People that, that are seeing Jesus in their dreams. But here's what I want to, I want to I give you a caution this morning. That those things are not authority in your life. They're not authoritative, but they're only promptings. They are promptings from people from our circumstances from from dreams that we've had and they're not ultimate authority and so what we do when we see and we go okay I think God's speaking through this person I think God is speaking through the circumstance we take it through a threefold test now if you've been through our disciple making uh, material through the growth series you probably know exactly what I'm about to say and so if you have not then you go ahead and get your pen and paper out because this is going to be a brilliant tool and it's not that sophisticated but write it down so if you think that a believer is speaking and, and it's from God or a circumstance or a dream, here's a threefold test. One, does it glorify Jesus? Two, is it consistent with God's word? And three, is it consistent with God's character? One, does it glorify Jesus? Two, is it consistent with God's character? Three, is it consistent with his word? And if, if it passes that threefold test, then it is God. 
Because God will not contradict what is in his word. He will not contradict what his character is and he is not going to not glorify Jesus. All right, so, so if, if God has already taught Jesus what needs to be taught and Jesus then taught that and now the Spirit's teaching that and it's already been recorded here for us then this is our ultimate authority, church. And so we can hear people say, well, I think God's saying this and if it's not in alignment with his word, you go, hey, I'm so sorry, but that, I mean, that's just not what God's saying because it's just not lined up with his word. I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a woman of his word. See, calling, it's not a destination, but a, a present faithfulness to Jesus. Not so much a destination, but a journey. A journey of faithfully walking with God, listening to his voice, praying and communicating with him. It's out of that primary call that God guides us along our lives according to our passions and our abilities and the desires of our hearts. And we live out this primary call in those places, in those destinations, and in the things that we do in our vocations, in our hobbies. Even when opposition came, Moses walked with God. Even when he found himself butt up against the Red Sea and he said, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't understand what to do. He called out to God and God gave him the wisdom and the God. He said, look, this is what I'm going to do and here's what I need you to do. And he, he gave him that direction. Even when people would question his leadership, he listened to God. He listened to his voice and God gave him guidance. God gave him wisdom as he moved step by step by step by step. And I wonder how many of us find ourselves disappointed and discouraged right now in our current season of life. Things didn't work out like they're supposed to. People are questioning whether I'm supposed to be doing this. Things didn't, go, I, mean, I mean, just think about it. Just put it in there, X, that's what it is. And, and that is what is discouraging you right now. And I wanna give you just a little glimpse of hope. And, and this comes from Exodus because when Moses was walking with God, there came discouragement in his life. In fact, if we were to go all the way back to Exodus and we look at Exodus chapter three, verses 11 and 13, you can go there, but we won't have time to hit all this, but go back to Exodus chapter three, verses 11 and 13. And when Moses felt inadequate, God said, I've chosen you. When Moses said, hey, I don't know what to say when I get there, God said, just tell him I am who I am, that I am who I am has sent you. I have chosen you. In Exodus chapter four, uh, verse one, Moses felt insecure and God said, I have empowered you. You may not have all that you need, but I have empowered you. In Exodus chapter 4, 10, Moses felt inferior, but God said, I have gifted you. When Moses said, I can't speak, Lord, so why are you sending me to go speak to your people? He said, look, why are you questioning your gifting? I'm the one that's given you your gifting. I'm the one that's gonna empower you for the ministry. And so he said, look, I've gifted you. And then, and then later he said, okay, hey, uh, Exodus 4, 13, Moses felt insufficient. And then God said, look, I'm sending you. See, at some point, Moses is going, hey, look, I just, I can't do it. Just stop. Don't, I, I, I just can't be sent. And God's saying, look, I have chosen you. I have empowered you. I have gifted you with everything that you need in ministry. And now I'm sending you out as my representative in this world to make disciples, to share the gospel to the lost, to deliver my people. And church, that's a word for you this morning that you have been called, that you have been empowered, that you have been uh, gifted, that you have been sent on a mission. Church, that is something to be excited about, that that's what God has done in your life. But we don't understand those promises until we're being with him. And we also miss those promises because we're so busy trying to do something for him and yet he's still sitting there going, would you just be with me? You've been called empowered and gifted and sent on a mission. To wrap up our time together, I want to talk about a guy by the name of Leonardo da Vinci. Now, many of you may know his painting, The, the Last Supper, right? You had all the disciples around the table, if you remember that mural that was painted on a wall. He also painted what was called the Mona Lisa. And da Vinci started off as a, as a, as a man who was very focused. That's why we have these paintings that are very famous from him. But would you believe that I told you that he had many paintings that were marvelous? Maybe could have even outweighed the Last Supper, even outweighed the Mona Lisa. But they're incompleted. In fact, he, did, he dabbled in some architectural engineering. He dabbled in some science. He dabbled in some other stuff. And he just kept trying to do all of these different things. And, and throughout life, as he got older and older and older, he saw that life was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. 
And so he just kept running. I, I'm not satisfied with that. And he would drop that project. And I mean, that just, that's not fine and fulfilling that. So he would drop that project. And he left all these things incomplete. And when he died, many people were, were saddened by the fact that there were so many things that he could have offered to this world, so many great paintings and, and inventions. But he could never complete them. Why? Because he found his purpose and fulfillment in the things and not in somebody. See, we're not called to some place or some thing. We're called to somebody. We're called to Jesus. And Jesus is giving the same call that he's been given throughout all the generations. It's the same call that he gave to all his disciples. And he said this to his disciples, follow me. Follow me. He's giving you the same call today. In fact, when we look at the life of Moses, the life of Moses is a foreshadow of Jesus coming. Moses came down out of the palace, out of his riches, his possessions, his power and his prestige. And he came down and he said, I am going to forsake these things just as Christ forsaked his place to come among my people who are oppressed and deliver them from the hands of the Israelites. Jesus left his home in heaven, came down, humbled himself to the point of being a servant, to the point of being put on a cross, dying on a cross, dying to death that we deserve. Why? Because he saw that we were broken. He saw that we needed to be delivered. And so Jesus came down, he lived the life that we should have lived and he died the death that we deserve to die because our sin separates us from God. And then he died that death, he laid his life down, he rose from the grave three days later providing the only way, the only means in which that we can return to the Father and be right before God. And he's saying this to you this morning, will you follow me? Will you follow me? This is the call that he has for us today to be with him. And it's out of that being with him that we begin to understand what we are to do in this life. And I want to give you that same opportunity today. I want to give you an opportunity because I know there's many people that have been saying, man, I, you know, I've been trying to do all these great things for God. And I thought that would give me to heaven, but man, now I understand it's being with God that makes me right with him. That being with Jesus because of what he's done, he's accomplished, that I could be made right before God. And in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, don't harden your hearts. When you hear this message, don't harden your hearts. Don't grow callous to this message, but accept it. Accept the invitation. And so I want to give you that opportunity today. So I just want everybody just to bow your head. And I I just want to give the opportunity for that person or those people in this crowd right now that are saying, Man, I I need to be made right with God. You know what? I thought, man, I thought, man, if I died today, I thought, man, I would be before God. But man, honestly, I've been trying to do a lot of things to to make it. And I'm really starting to realize that, man, there's nothing that I can do to be made right before God. That all I can do is accept the invitation that Jesus gives, and that is to follow him. Because it's only through Jesus It's only through Jesus that you are made right before God. And he's giving you an invitation today to turn from your old life, to accept this new life that he wants to give you. And he's saying, follow me. So I want to lead you through a prayer this morning for that person, for those people in the room that you say, man, I'm ready to be made right before God. That I just, I I know that today if I was not, if I was to die, I know I won't be before God. And I want to be sure of that. And if that's you, if you want to be included in this prayer, would you just slip your hand up? No one's looking. You're just going to raise your hand up and just say, Cameron, I, I want to be included in this prayer today. If that's you, just slip your hand up in the air. Hey, I, I need to be made right before God. I, I'm not sure about my destination. <laughs> I've realized that, man, I, I, I need to be with God instead of just doing something for Him. If that's you, just slip your hand up and just say, Cameron, I, I, I want to pray that prayer with you this morning. Awesome. Thank you. If you raised your hand, if you didn't raise your hand this morning, Just pray this along with me. Father, I confess my sin to you. God, I know it separates me from you. Forgive me, God, that I try to do all kinds of things to be made right before you. And now I understand, God, that the only way I'm made right before you is to be right with Jesus, to be with him, to follow him. And so God, give my life to you today. And I ask that you would come and make it whole and make it clean. God, I surrender to you. You have my yes. God, help me to follow you and to listen to your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, pray for all of us today, this morning. God, that you would help us to remove the the anxiousness and the confusion and the frustration in our lives by walking with you. God, understand that our central purpose in life, God, is to be with you. It's a present faithfulness to you right 
now. So God, as we go about our day, God, help us to just walk a little closer with you today and to see you in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.